Hello, AP Chemistry, and welcome to your first recorded lecture. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, section 1.1 and 1.3 for unit one. Um, you already should have reviewed moles and empirical formula um, over the summer. So this is kind of giving you an idea of how AP can go deeper given even basic topics. Okay, so in this PowerPoint, the beginning, I'm not going to go through in this lecture, but the hard copy of the PowerPoint is going to be provided for you, so you have these notes if you want them. They are the basics of moles, right? Like we learned this last year, you know how to find molar mass, you know how to go from uh, a mole to a mass and a mass to a mole, but if you forgot, the notes are in here. Um, I have also queued the videos in AP Classroom that go over this stuff. Um, if you need to, please take advantage of that review. I will be posting the answers um, in this PowerPoint to these like practice questions so you can test and see if you're doing all right with those topics. All right, and then the empirical formula, if you've forgotten the steps, those are here as well. All right, so the important thing, how is the AP exam going to make moles more intense? Because it's gonna happen. You really very rarely have a question on the AP exam that just asks, how many moles is this given a mass? It's, that's just too basic of a concept, so they're gonna make it a little trickier for you. One of those ways is to talk about things called hydrates, okay? A hydrate is gonna be any salt that is always bonded to a certain amount of waters. Um, so, uh, a lot of compounds are what we call hygroscopic, which means they pull water in from the surroundings. If you ever see those little desiccant packets in um, things you buy, the little things that say do not eat, those absorb water, same way that some salts will absorb water. So, uh, copper sulfate, the hydrate is this bright, deep blue color the anhydrous, so anhydrous means without water. The anhydrous form is gonna be a lot lighter and it's not gonna be nearly as pretty, okay? So this is how they will show you what a hydrate is, okay? So barium chloride will always be bonded to two waters, and okay? That's what that times two waters means. Um, our iron sulfate, our iron two sulfate, is always going to be bonded to six waters, and so on and so forth. So if you see anything like this, um, they're just talking about a hydrate. It is just barium chloride. It just means that if you have a pile of barium chloride, there will also be water. Um, this is important because some chemicals react violently in the presence of water. If you've ever seen those videos where they throw sodium into a lake, um, you want to know if there's something with water in it. Um, I remember back when I was in AP chemistry. Oh, no, actually, it was the year after. It was the year I was a lab tech, so my senior year of high school. Uh, the teacher before me, they were doing some chemical reaction, and she wanted to make it prettier, so she was going to add, I think it was copper sulfate to it. She's like, it'll make it blue. We'll have, like, blue fireworks or whatever it was it was going to be. Not, like, actual fireworks, but some kind of a demo. And the chemical that she was demonstrating was something that reacted violently to water. And to test it out, luckily with no students around, she had added some of that copper sulfate and it had like mini exploded because she had a very small amount. Um, but I remember she came and told me and had to warn me, you know, don't forget about hydrates because it's easy to forget sometimes. Uh, but I digress why this is important. So that this formula means one mole of barium chloride will always contain two moles of water. So if we wanted to figure out the mass of just barium chloride, you would have to subtract the mass that would be accounted for by the water. A one way that you will see hydrate problems in chemistry a lot, and we usually would do this lab, we're not going to, you would Take a hydrate, heat it until all the water evaporates off. You would take the mass before, the mass after. So you would have 
the mass of your hydrate, the mass of your anhydrous salt. So that would be like, I took my salt, I heated it until it was totally dry, and that's my anhydrous salt. So any mass lost here would be the mass of water that your salt contained. And then you can use that information to determine how much water you had compared to how much salt you had. So these are gonna be the steps you would take to solve a problem like this. So we're gonna find the mass of the water lost, convert the mass of the water to moles of water, find moles of your anhydrous salt, and then divide by the smaller number to get a mole ratio. These steps are gonna look pretty familiar. Um, it's similar to finding an empirical formula because it's a kind of the sim a same idea. So for example, cupric chloride, so copper two chloride, has some amount of water with it. When it's heated, it is dehydrated. So if I had 0.235 grams of copper chloride and after heating, I only had 0.185 grams, what is that value of X? So I wanna know for every mole of copper chloride, how many moles of water do I usually have? So our step one, we're gonna find that mass of the water lost. That's an easy subtraction, right? My anhydrous is gonna be my salt without the water. I'm gonna convert that mass to moles, which we're all experts at. And we're gonna leave a good amount of sig figs, right? So we had, and I should have um, put a zero at the end here. Yeah, I wanna fix it. Zero. Zero. I feel better about that now. Okay, sorry. So our mass to moles, we have point or 2.78 times 10 to the negative third moles of water. Then we are going to find the moles of our salt. And remember, this is gonna be just our anhydrous salt. So that 0.185, we wanna know how many moles of copper chloride there were. So we're gonna divide that by its molar mass to get its moles. We're gonna divide by the smaller of those two number of moles to get our ratio. So the easiest thing here is to not be lazy with your units. We had 2.78 moles of water and 1.38 times 10 to the negative third moles of copper chloride. That gives us a pretty nice two to one ratio. And you can remember it's two of what to one of what by leaving those units there, right? I kept moles of water, my moles of copper chloride. So therefore it was CuCl2 with two waters. All right, so that is my hydrate problem. So that's how we can just make simple moles more complicated um, for an AP style question. Once again, that doesn't mean you're gonna get exactly this problem, right? We have to use our problem solving skills and see how we can apply what we know to this situation. So that's what you guys are gonna do. Let me move my face. Goodbye face. Okay, um, so pause your video here and you're gonna be answering this question. So you were given an experiment just like the experiment that I described. This time you have magnesium chloride and they give you a bunch of data from the lab. I want you to answer the following questions. And actually you're only gonna have to answer, I think both, oh my gosh, go away thing, exit. I don't think I actually wanna push that. Yeah, I did not wanna push that. Okay. Right. Okay, determine the formula of the hydrated compound. So when you have to type this in for Ed Puzzle, I want you to just do like uh, MgCl2. Actually, you know what you can do? I will just have you type in the number that N is. Okay, so if it's MgCl2 for H2O or 3H2O or 10H2O, I just want you to type in that number as your answer. All right, when you are done with that, you can continue on to our next topic. All right, so our next topic, where did my face go? There it is. All right, our next topic is gonna be empirical formulas, okay? So it would be nice if we just had a regular empirical formula problem. 
Um, and actually, sometimes you will. You'll you notice hopefully in our summer homework that there was a decent amount of examples of just empirical formula questions um, from old AP problems. Uh, but they can make it a little bit more intense, and that's going to be called a combustion analysis. So before we talk about combustion analysis, we need to talk about what combustion reactions are again. So combustion reactions is that general term for anything that has a hydrocarbon or hydrocarbon type molecule reacting with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O. So because I have X's and Y's here, this is not a balanced equation. The coefficients would change based on what our actual hydrocarbon is. Um, hydrocarbon is going to be a general term here. Some of our hydrocarbons are going to be with oxygen, so CHO. Sometimes they will be CHN. Sometimes they will be CHON. Um, it really depends on the problem, and you can see quite a variety. There will be um, just a couple assigned homework problems over this, uh, but I will also uh, post an optional practice if you feel like you need a little more help with these. Okay, so the key to combustion reactions is to use the law of conservation of mass. Okay, so any carbon that was combusted is going to be present as carbon dioxide at the end, okay? Because it'll say it was completely combusted. So if you know the mass of CO2 that you got from your reaction, you know the mass of carbon that you must have had in your hydrocarbon because any carbon that was combusted had to show up as CO2. The same thing is true for your hydrogen. And any water that you produced had to come, the hydrogens had to come from that hydrocarbon. The same cannot be said for oxygens because notice that it shows up in two different spots. And sometimes if it's a CHO compound, it could have come from two different spots. So we're going to use kind of process of elimination on how much oxygen we have if you need to find that. So let's look at what a combustion reaction analysis could look like. So a compound is compo composed of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. So right off the bat, this is going to be a CHN problem. When 0.1156 grams of this compound is reacted with oxygen, by reacted it means burned or combusted, we produce carbon dioxide and water, and it gives you masses of both of those. The nitrogen gas produced was not collected. We want to find the empirical formula. Okay, so let's go and look back at our formula. We are going to have nitrogen also there. But we want to find empirical formula. And from all of your empirical formula problems, in order to do that, you need masses of each element. Okay, so we weren't given masses of each element. We were given masses of carbon dioxide and masses of water. From that, though, we're going to do some math and we're going to say, okay, if I have X amount of carbon dioxide, I know that would contain X amount of carbon. So I'm going to show you the math for that. I just wanted to walk you through the logic of these because, again, um, while you'll see similar problems, you really need to understand the why and not just memorize the steps in order to be successful at this. All right, so in order to find the empirical formula, you need the moles of all of our component parts. So I rewrote our formula here. We have some amount of carbon, some amount of hydrogen, and some amount of nitrogen reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen gas. So I'm going to use our amount of carbon dioxide, which was that 0.1638 grams, to determine how much carbon I had. This is my setup. So I have 0.1638 grams of carbon dioxide. Now look at the ratio I used over here. You'll notice that down here is our molar mass, right? We have 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide in every mole. There is, in that carbon dioxide, 12.01 grams of carbon. This is true. In every one mole of carbon dioxide, there is 12.01 grams of carbon. So look what happens with our units here. We have grams of carbon dioxide that will cancel out, and we'll be left with grams of carbon. Okay, so this is our grams of carbon. Cool. We're going to do the same thing with water. 
So they told us that we had 0.1676 grams of water. For every mole of water, right, our molar mass, is that 18.02 grams of water. In one mole of water, we have two hydrogens. So the mass of hydrogen in that case is 2.02 grams. So again, look at our units here. Grams of water will cancel, and you'll be left with grams of hydrogen. So we did our math for the two numbers they gave us. They gave us the mass of carbon dioxide and the mass of water, um, and we found our mass of carbon and our mass of hydrogen. But if we wanna find the empirical formula, we need to also have a mass of nitrogen. So let's go back and look at our problem again. We know that the total mass of our compound was this 0.1156. We now know how much of these uh, products were our carbon and our hydrogen. Because of the law of conservation of mass, we know that mass cannot be created or destroyed. So this 0.1156 comes from our carbon, our hydrogen, and our nitrogen. So if we know two, we know the third. In our 0.15, yeah, our compound minus our carbon minus our hydrogen is going to be the nitrogen that is left over. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Of course, we'll have a question and answer session for anything that doesn't. So please like write down your questions, email me your questions. Um, don't think that because this is recorded, I don't care what you think, okay? Because I do. So once we have our grams, if we wanna find empirical formula, now it's totally normal like the empirical formula we learned last year. Grams to moles, notice that I did not write out the process. If you need help, we can talk through how I got from grams to moles. So that's that first arrow here. Changed grams of carbon to moles of carbon, grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen, grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen. Then our next step for empirical formula is dividing by the smallest number. In this case, our 0 0.003719 moles was our smallest, and that gives us a one to five to one ratio. So we have our empirical formula. Hopefully that process makes sense. So this was just going over how to make how empirical formula could be harder, right? We just had to be a little clever with what the information they were giving us and how we could get to the information we needed. Because usually we just start here on the left. We had to do this extra AP level work um, to get us to these masses. Now here is your on your own challenge problem. So you will pause your video, work on this, and then the only thing you'll have to type in for me as an answer is gonna be determining that empirical formula of the compound. So you'll notice that this one has carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, so it might take you a minute to do this one. So you'll just type it in like this. So it'd be like C1H7N2O4. That is not right, unless I'm a very good guesser. Um, but I, what I mean is don't worry about um, making them subscripts for the answer here. All right, good luck.